The, the title of the message this morning is very simple. Rising from defeat to victory. Rising from defeat to victory. Might I say apparent defeat. The idea that maybe we've been defeated. Now I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm sure that you've watched movies and heard stories about people that were in deep trouble and then along came superhero. Big muscles, good looking like me dashing in there to just save the people. And you've looked at that and you thought, wow, that's great. And something inside of you said, yeah, but that's not me. For one, I'm short, I'm vertically challenged, and I, I, I don't have big muscles and I, I can't do that, so it's not for me. I want to introduce you this morning to a character you know very well. And we find him in the Old Testament. If you want to go there, it's in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 40, it's the whole chapter. I'm going to read some verses and then we're going to kind of walk our way through that and learn some lessons about, from Gideon. Let me just also say a few, a few more things about this uh, story. Is that um, today this is a, a message that is going to challenge your paradigms of how you think and how you see yourself. That's the, that's the crux of the message. It's not so much a practical message on what you can do, but more a, a message designed to be focused on who you should be. Who you be. I met a pastor in Miami, Florida many years ago, and he said this to us. He said, you is what you is, and if you is what you ain't, then you ain't what you is. You is what you is, and if you is what you ain't, then you ain't what you is. You work it out. Okay? Listen to the video again and write it down and then you work it out. And so some of us today are sitting here and we is what we is, but we is what we ain't because we ain't what we is. Because we're showing something that we ain't. And so this message is going to challenge you in the area of your paradigms, primarily about how you see yourself, but how you see the body of Christ as well to some measure. Because we are the body of Christ. So, this is a personal thing. Now, You've all heard the story about the chicken, I mean the eagle, whose egg, who was in an egg and the egg got dumped on a farm and uh, he, he hatched out of the egg and he was amongst the chickens. You know that story. And so the eagle was scratching around in the dirt like a chicken, you know, pecking in the ground and he grew up to maturity and one day the eagle was out in the garden scratching around like the chickens on the farm. He was doing his thing. He even tried to make noise like a chicken but it didn't do so well and they laughed at him and made fun of him. And finally one day he's out there scratching in the dirt and a shadow passes over him and as the shadow passed over him he kind of looked up to say what's causing the shadow? And as he looked up he didn't realize but there was another eagle flying by and suddenly this little eagle, this young eagle looked and said uh -huh. He looks like I do. They don't look like I do. Maybe I'm not them, maybe I'm them. And finally he began to flex his wings and finally he took off never ever to grovel again in the dirt. The key question I have for you today is, are you going to stay as an eagle groveling in the dirt or are you going to decide it's time to fly with the eagles? That's the question I have for you. You are an eagle. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's we are eagles. Okay? But some of us have been brought up on a farm with chickens. <laughs> and so we think we're chickens. Today may the Lord open your eyes so that you begin to see yourself as the eagle you really are. And what triggered this message in many respects? I watched a video this weekend. Uh, this week, sorry, this past week, I watched a video on, I, I think it was on Facebook, on YouTube, one of the things I caught my attention. It was about a, a, a guy who owned a restaurant, I think it was in the States somewhere, and some vegan people, you know these people who promote veganism, or being a vegan, they came to protest outside his restaurant because he sold meat. They supplied meat dishes. Now, in America, you're allowed to protest, it's, you're allowed to do that. What many people don't know, you're allowed to counter-protest as well. And they don't do that. And they just step back. And so what happened was, this guy put a table by the shop front window on the inside. These people are outside screaming, 
down with this shop. You must support. You don't kill animals. They also need to live and carry on like they normally do. And so he just looked and he went, okay. And he came with a chunk of meat. And he put it on the table by the window. And he sliced it. And he diced it. And they were screaming and going wild. And then he walked away with his meat to the kitchen and he cooked it and he came back and he sat at the table with his knife and his fork and his spices and he began to cut the meat and eat it and it was dripping down. And they were going wild outside. Now some of you might say, well, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have done that. You see, because you're a chicken. That's what chickens do. And hide in the kitchen. And for a long time, that's what we as Christians have done. When people have come and said, your God is dead. You can't tell me about creation. Evolution is the answer. We've backtracked and we've backpedaled and we've hidden ourselves in the little kitchen somewhere. You know, had our little prayer meeting quietly. Had our little uh, Bible study quietly. You know, don't get out there. And I applaud that man. He said, listen, you can be a, you can be a vegan. That's okay. I am a carnivore. I eat meat. And that's it. You see, he wasn't fighting against them. He was just standing up for what he believed in. They were fighting against him, not standing up for what they believed in. Listen, if you want to be a vegan, be a vegan. More power to you. But don't come to my house when I'm having a bright place with your pickets and your, your signboards. Mr. Ghani, you should be eating vegetables only and whatever, ever, ever. No. Go and be a vegan at your house and stay at your house and be a vegan. Don't come to my house and give me a hard time. Because if you do, I'll open my door and let my Rottweiler help you out. I don't have a Rottweiler. That just kind of came out of nowhere. Okay, so let's go to Judges chapter 6. We're going to read some verses and then we're going to go through this and learn. Now, by the way, you all know the story of Gideon. And most of us know that he defeated the Midianites with an army of 300. We know the story that God trimmed him from 30,000 to 300. And we say, wow, amazing, amazing. It's a great victory. It's awesome. I want to take you to the beginning. Because the beginning is crucial. Because Gideon is like so many of us are. And we're going to see that in the story today. So many of us can identify with this guy Gideon. If we look at the beginning. So, I'm going to try and stay on track today. And the sons of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Just remember that one. If you've got, a, if you've got your Bible open, you may want to just put a little check mark or something against there as a reminder. The people did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves dens which are in the mountains and the caves. Can you see? God's people, under attack, they went and hid. Now, I'm not saying that it, it's wrong to hide. I'm just saying that that's what they did. That's what we as believers, the church, has done for so, off, for long, for so long, so often. We've hidden. When people stood up and said, you happy clappers, we said, hey, guys, you know, just do that on Sunday. And don't clap too loud. When, we, when the Holy Ghost came upon people and they spoke in tongues and people criticized and questioned. We, we got defensive and we hid away. When we began to teach values that are biblical and people opposed us, we hid away. That's what these people did. So it's, we're, not, we're not in strange company. We, 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 people, we behave like them. But we're going to change that today. And says, and they came up against them and destroyed the increase of the earth as far as Gaza. And they left no sustenance in Israel, as well as sheep or ox or donkey. Let's keep moving. For they came up with their livestock and their tents and their camels. They would come in like locusts in number and they were innumerable. And they came into the land to ravage it. Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. It happened when they did that... Uh, to the Lord, they, they cried to the Lord because of Midian. The Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of Egypt, of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you. And I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. Underline those words in your Bible. I gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But 
You have not listened to my voice. You have not listened to my voice. Now, some of you might have been saying when I mentioned Gideon, ah, we've heard the messages about Gideon. I know one pastor read about his story. For two months, in one year, for two months, every Sunday, he preached, and every Wednesday, because they had a midweek service, every Sunday, every Wednesday, he preached exactly the same message, exactly the same text, exactly the same illustrations, for two months straight. Preached the same message. One of the elders came to me and said, uh, Pastor, can we talk? Are you having some challenges in your life? You know, because you keep preaching the same message. Um, have you lost out of new, are you, are you out of new material? Do you need some help? He says, no. That's what the Lord told me to preach, so I'm preaching it. He says, but pastor, you've been, it's two months, same message. Hey, Shamari. <laughs> we need something fresh, you know. He says, listen, I, I said to the Lord, you can't expect me to preach the same message all the time. And the Lord said, they're not getting it the first time, so keep speaking it until they get it. So some of you might say, but I know about, okay, cool. Maybe you didn't get it. I'm praying this morning that you'll get it. That's why we're visiting it again, because we need to get it. Okay? Not shouting at you, just saying. Now this is it. The angel of the Lord came and sat under an oak tree, which was in Ophrah. And there, that pertained to Joash. It belonged to Joash the Abiezerite. And his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Okay? Gideon is beating out the wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. He's hiding away. Everybody say hiding away. Tell your neighbor he was hiding away. Tell your other neighbor he was scared. And if you got courage, I mean he was poop bang. He was very scared. Okay? That's where Gideon was. And so the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, OMG, are you serious? If the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? Where are all his wondrous works which our fathers told us of saying, didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has cast us off and delivered us into the hand of Midian. What I love about this encounter is we see Gideon saying, yeah, okay, you say I'm a mighty warrior, but if the Lord was with us, because that's the opening line, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Well, if the Lord is with us, why in heaven's name is the situation so bad? And I dare say there's Christians in Zimbabwe right now who are asking the same question. We've been saying, Lord, got his hand on Zimbabwe. He's the king of Africa. And they say, uh-huh. Then why are we in this mess? Why? You know, I mean, really, if we were, we, you know, things should be better. Have you heard that? Yeah, of course. Of course. And maybe you've said it yourself. Maybe in the quietness of your little room somewhere, you've lamented before the Lord with tears and snot and trana and said, oh, Lord, you've left us. You've forgotten us. I know it's Bulawayo, but for goodness sake, remember us. I understand that. And so Gideon is saying all of this. What I love about this is the angel of the Lord does not answer the question that Gideon asked. Have you noticed whenever you talk to the Lord, and you complain, and you ask him questions out of your complaining, he doesn't answer your question. Have you noticed he does that? Look what the angel of the Lord says. And the Lord looked at him and said, Go in the strength of yours, and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Look, haven't I sent you? And I can see Gideon going, Ah, Wena, are you not listening? I've just been telling you that if God, look at the mess we're in, and you come and tell me, by the way, do you know where I am? I'm hiding away. <laughs> and there's a reason I'm hiding away. I'm afraid. And you tell me, go in the strength you have. Now, I don't know about you people, but, you know, I got to be careful where I hang out because I'm vertically challenged. And I've got well, my arms are not too skinny, but I mean, I'm a kind of a skinny guy, so I've got to be careful. You know, if, if I go up against people like Simon, I've got to watch out, you know. Guys like Simon, they just, you know, they just grab me by the neck and they just go, and that's it, and it's the end, end of the game. 
Now, can you imagine someone saying to me, small guy like I am, go up against LeBron James and score a dunk over him? Be like, hang on a minute. Can you see me? See, the challenge is that the enemy tries to get you to look at you. God tries you to get a look at him. And the message this morning is about moving from a defensive mindset, really, to an offensive one. That's what we're talking about. So let's get back now to the story. Okay, so the Midianites on the warpath, they're attacking. The Lord refers to Gideon as a, uh, as, as a mighty warrior. Let's pick up the story. There's some things we're going to learn. First thing we learn about the humanity of Gideon. He sees everything and he says, yo, we're in trouble. We, I'm, 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 and you'll read it in the, in, the, in the book of Judges chapter 6. He says, I am from the, the smallest tribe and our family is the poorest in the tribe and I'm the youngest in the family. You can't get much worse than that. And you are saying to me, Go in the strength you've got. You see, here's the thing, people. When God speaks to us, he always talks to us about going in the strength of and doing with what you have. The problem with us is we're always looking at what others have. And saying, but I don't have a nice voice like Pastor Eric, so how can I? It's okay. If you sing like a frog, maybe you bake like a queen. Go bake your cake. Because that's what you do. You see, God says to Gideon, go and do what you can do in your strength. Now, if you can't sing for heaven's sake, stay off the platform. Because you're not where you should be and you're using something you don't have. Use what you have. The question is, do you know what you have? See, the problem is, Whenever you realize what you have, you compare it to somebody else and you downplay what you have because you think somebody else got better than you. Several years ago when I was in Namibia, I had a Toyota Corolla. When it was given to me, it had 300,000 Ks on the clock, just so you know. 1600 Toyota Corolla, a red one. And I was busy cleaning it because I was getting ready to come to Zimbabwe. I had it serviced and everything. And this German guy, he was down because he was part of the ministry. And he walked past and he said to me, no matter how you clean it, it won't make it any better. Are you really planning to drive to Zimbabwe in that? I said, it's what I've got. And I clean it because a clean car is better than a dirty car. And I don't like to ride around in dirt. And I'm making a long journey. He says, do you think it will get you there? I said, I don't know. But I'll find out in a few hours' time. I'll find out. I've done everything I know to make it roadworthy. I've done everything I know to make it fit for the journey. Is it going to get me there? I'll find out. But it's all I got. I don't have an SUV. I don't have a fancy car. I have a Toyota Corolla with 300,000 Ks on the clock. And I've done all that I know to get it ready. Incidentally, just so you know, it took me to Zimbabwe and it took me all the way back. And I used it completely in, in Namibia all the time. When I finally sold it, it had 600,000 Ks on the clock. Yeah, I put on 300,000 myself. I said, one good turn deserves another. The key thing is, what have you got? Now, please don't downplay what you've got. God's not interested in how much it is. He's interested in you surrendering it. You say it's not enough. He says, give it to me. I'll show you about enough. The second thing that we can learn from this is that God is saying, I am sending you. You're not going on your own just because you want to go. I am sending you. And in that, I am sending you, God makes a commitment. If I am sending you, I will take care of you. That's what he's saying. How many of you work for a company and then they say to you, we're sending you to Joburg for a conference. And then ask you to pay your own FA. Isn't it? Most times what happens is, we're sending you to the conference, they pay your conference fee, they buy your airfare, they give you a, an allowance every day for meals. They try to make sure that you're taken care of. Because 
If they didn't, you say, ah, I've got no money. How can I go to Joburg? You want me to go? You pay for me. God is the same. God, you want me to do this? I know you'll take care of it. You'll make the way. So when God says, I am sending you, who are you and I to say, I'm not going? Try it with your boss. I'm sending you to Harari for the three-day workshop. I'm not going. Ah. Uh-huh. You'll get a letter of warning if you're lucky. You don't do that. And in fact, many of us, when the boss says, I'm sending you, we're already excited. We come home laughing and joking. Yeah, guess what? I'm going to Joe Beck. Ah, and I don't have to pay. <laughs> and we're all excited. Why is it that when God wants to send us, we find all the reasons why it should be somebody else? Why it should be somebody else? The next thing, and I love this from Gideon. I love this, and maybe you've done the same. I can almost hear Gideon saying, are you kidding? You want me to go and save Israel from the Midianites who come in an innumerable number like locusts. They are tearing up the place. I'm hiding away so they don't get my little bit of wheat. And you want me to go put myself out on the front line and say to the Midianites, I've come to destroy you. Are you kidding? Are you all right, are you smoking in banji or something? Now, don't be disrespectful to God, but I can see Gideon kind of having this mindset. God, you, you, you really don't see this. See, Gideon didn't, Gideon didn't see yet, but he, he was looking at what he didn't have. He was looking at what he could see. He was looking at the enemy. God doesn't want you to necessarily look at the enemy. Because sometimes when you look at the enemy, you may lose heart. I was at, the, at BAC yesterday watching some of our lads playing in the junior ITF open competition. And I watched one of our lads, he came up, and when he walked onto the court, as he walked onto the court, I was looking, I was sitting up in the grandstand, and I looked at him walking on the court, I said, this guy is nervous. And he's, I can see he's tense. Even when I was watching his warm-up, I could see there was no fluidity and like he normally, and I said, this boy is in trouble. Because if he doesn't get his mind into gear, He's not going to do well. Sadly, he didn't do well. He lost both sets. Six love, six love. It was best of three sets. He lost both sets. Six love, six love. Not because he's a bad tennis player. That's the point. But because up here, when he walked on the court, the fact that this is the ITF Junior Open, he was playing against an opposition guy from Botswana, and he was looking, and and the whole uh, size of the event maybe got to him. And he didn't play his best game. Some of us are like that. That's why God keeps us from seeing the enemy. Because if you saw the enemy, you would lose heart and you would give up. And that's what Gideon was ready to do. Lose heart and give up. And so he says, Lord, if you really want me to to, to go, give me a sign. Have you done that with the Lord before? (laughs) Give me a sign. Just so I know that I'm on track, that I should be. You know? And some of us even have done this where we take our Bible and we just say, okay, I'll just, put it, I'll just let it fall. And whichever page it opens to, the God is speaking to me. You know, it's like a holy wind blows up to Genesis chapter 21 or something or wherever. Or Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> yes. We've done all of those things, and Gideon is no different. And I want to just say this to you. God is not afraid to give you a sign, but warning to you all, warning to me. When you ask God for a sign, and he gives it to you, stop asking. Start stepping. Get out there, because now you know. I mean, what more do you need? So Gideon says he's going to make some food. He makes some food, brings it, puts it on the rock. The angel touches it. Bang, it burns up. On fire, gone. Okay, I get the message. I got to go and set the people free. And then in verses 25 to verse 32 of the chapter, and this for some of you is going to be very difficult. For some of you it's going to be tough. The angel of the Lord says to Gideon, go and get your father's two bulls, kill them and sacrifice them. So here's the application. Because remember we're talking about our mindset. 
Remember I told you about the young man that I said came onto the tennis court. His mind was in that place of I can't do this. I, I, he was intimidated. And though he was skilled, though he is good, he didn't play his best game. Didn't play his best match. Right? Because of his mindset. And so the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, and the angel of the Lord knows, before I send you out there, there's some stuff we've got to get rid of. You've got to kill the bull. Now you all know the word that goes after bull. That you got from your parents. That you got from your upbringing. That you got from your tribe. That you got from your community. Whatever it is. You colored people can't do anything. All you do is smoke and banjo and get drunk. Heard that one before? You're my carrots. Have you heard that one before? Yeah. Don't, don't be shy. All of a sudden, oh, nervous. Oh. Okay? I mean, they said white people can't jump. They lie. I've met lots of white people who can jump. Hello? And they say women can't drive. Ah! Women can drive. They can even drive you crazy. But seriously. <laughs> can you, you understand this? Women, so what we have, we've got, we've got all this bull that we got from somewhere. Now listen to us. Listen to me. You may have had a hurtful or a negative experience or a painful experience. That's not bull. Let me be very clear. You went to the, to the church. You were standing at the altar and she never came. You were ditched at the altar. I will never trust a woman ever again. She ditched me at the altar. You can't trust these women. That's the bull. Are you getting me? That's the bull. And that's the stuff we've got to get rid of us. Some of us have grown up in communities where things have happened. In home situations where things haven't been the best. But the enemy knows in that moment of your vulnerability, he can peddle a lie. He can put some bull into your head and you will believe it. And once he's got you believing it, that's it. Have you ever been walking with people in the dark at dusk on a, uh, on a camp? And you're walking one behind the other. And the front guy does this. <laughs> and everybody does this. <laughs> Why are you jumping? Well, he jumped. Why did he jump? I was just messing around. Because <laughs> they thought there was a snake or something. So everybody just did this, copying everybody. Because in your mind, it told you something. Those of you that play sport, those of you that do things like that, you know when you walk onto the court, when you walk onto the field, up here is critical. You can have the skill, but if we get you here, you're in trouble. I did it. I went up to a guy who was six foot four many years ago. Skinny little me. And I went up to him and I said to him, are they seriously putting you on this team to play basketball? A guy like you. Ish. The only reason they put you there is because you're tall, and that's only a fact of your birth and your genetics and your DNA. You're not a good basketball player. You're just a tall guy. I'll show you. You can't even shoot. But we'll see. He said to me, ah, Eric, how can you say that about me? I said, because it's the truth. I got into his head. He took a shot. He missed. I said, I told you you can't shoot. But you didn't believe me. You are rubbish. And I kept on to my shame. I'm not proud of it. But what I'm trying to illustrate is, I did it after 10 minutes of playing. He called his coach and said, please sub me. The boy couldn't even dribble the ball anymore. When they passed him, he was fumbling the ball. And every time he fumbled the ball, I laughed. I said, ah, <laughs> you. And in the end, he couldn't play. What has the enemy done to get into your head? And he's laughing all the way to the bank because what you are doing is, and let me say this carefully. Because some of you may think that I'm insensitive. There's too many hurt people in the body of Christ who are focusing on their hurt and not on the God who's bigger than their hurt. I'm not saying you didn't get hurt. Jesus died on a cross. You think he didn't get hurt? He did. Some of us are so busy telling everybody how hard it's been for us, how tough it's been for us. And then we use that as a justification to not do what God has called us to do. Remember Gideon said, Lord, if you were with us, we wouldn't have had this problem. I'm from the smallest family in the, in the smallest tribe and I'm the youngest, blah, 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 blah. The angel of the Lord doesn't even answer him and says, go in the strength you've got. God has been trying to say that to the body of Christ for so long. Go in the strength you've got. And we're saying, 
Uh, I was hurt when I was a little boy. I was hurt when I was a little girl. My father didn't do this. He didn't come watch me play soccer. My mother wasn't a nice woman. I'm not saying those things didn't happen, and I'm not saying they weren't painful. But what I am saying is the God we serve is bigger than that. And if you keep putting that as an excuse, it's going to keep being an excuse. And you're never going to get the healing for which God came and for which Jesus died on the cross. If you keep scratching the wound, how is it ever going to heal? Look how hurt I am. And you come next week. Hey, that thing doesn't look like it's healing. Yeah, I keep digging it every day. But don't you want it to be healed? Yes, I want it. So why are you digging at it? Because that's the only thing I got. And if I keep digging at it, I don't have to do sport. If I keep digging at it, I don't have to go and preach to people. If I keep digging at it, I don't have to go and love people and visit them in the hospital or go and see them at home or talk to them about Jesus' love because look at how much pain I'm in. I'm not saying that the pain is not real. I'm just saying that God's bigger than your pain. He wants to heal you. But you can't get healed if your brain is, I've got to keep this thing alive. How many of you people have heard people talking about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? Now, let me say it, and let me say it very carefully. For many years, on the 18th of April, what did we hear on our national airwaves? On Independence Day, 18th of April, the war of liberation, how bad the white people are. And I'm not saying they weren't bad. I'm not saying those days, those days. But you keep alive the racial tension. You keep alive the pain. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but for heaven's sake, at some point in time, you've got to grow up and go on and move on. How long have we been independent? How many years? Somebody tell me. How many years have we been independent as Zimbabwe? 41 years. Now, if a, if a child was born and, and is now 41 years old, and he's still wetting his pants, and wetting the bed, can't brush his teeth, can't do anything, and say, why? My mother, my father, but that was 41 years ago. It's time you get up. I'm not saying you didn't have a hard time. I'm not saying many of us didn't. I'm just saying at some point in time, if you're going to move forward, you've got to say, I'm not feeding the wound. That's, what Gideon, that's why Gideon had to get rid of his father's bull. Was apartheid oppressive? Yes. But the message that all whites are devils is bull. Are there black people who've made mistakes? Yes. But the idea that all black people are corrupt is bull. Do you see what I'm saying? Are there women who've been nagging, overbearing cows? Yes. But the bull is that all women are like that. Are there married men who've cheated on their wives? Yes. But the bull is to believe that every man cheats on his wife. It's a man thing. He's a man after all, you know. Can you see what the bull is? So I'm not saying that there weren't these things that happened, but what we have to do is what the enemy came in. That's why the angel of the Lord says to Gideon, go and kill your father's bull, because some of us have learned some bull from our parents. Now, it doesn't mean we dislike them. It doesn't mean we hate them. It just means they were wrong. I saw my dad slap my mother across the face. Do I love my dad, my late father? Yes. Always loved him. But dad, you were wrong. You should not have done that. I don't grow up saying, I used to watch my father walking with my mother in the supermarket. Oh, man, complaining and grunting and carrying on like a bear with a sore head. <clears throat> my mother saying, so should we buy this? Ah, whatever you want. <clears throat> and he carried on doing that. I go shopping with my wife. She says, honey, what do you think about this? I said, oh, that's interesting. Blah, 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 blah. You can go and ask her. I don't, I don't grumpy act with her and say, why are you bothering me? In fact, sometimes I do the shopping. And I'm not grumpy about that either. But there are things that we've learned from our moms and our dads, which are just plain, simple, unproductive, no longer valid. 
Does that mean we don't love our parents? Not by a long chalk. But at some point in time, you've got to grow up and say, Daddy was not right. Mommy was not right. I'm coming to the wrap-up. Because I know you all say, I want to go and eat my food. There's one more thing, and then I'm going to wrap it up. When you've decided to step out, you know, we sang a song this morning. We talked about, Holy Spirit, come and do your thing and take our hearts and change us. And sometimes we said, Lord, do something. Lord, do something. If only you do something. And the Lord says, I ain't going to do a thing until you get off your dirty little butt and do something. When you get up and take a step, then let's talk business. But as long as you're sitting there saying, Lord, do something, Lord, do something, Lord, do something, the Lord says, okay, what are you going to do? What have you done for me lately? Nothing. God waits. Go and read the scriptures. Go and read. Do this and I will do that. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear. We love to quote that scripture. But it says, if my people will do something, then I'll do something. And that's the standard. That's with God. And that's, what God, that's why Gideon had to get rid of his stuff. Because God is saying, I need you to step out. Where has God been saying to you, step out? And you've been saying, God, just show me that you're really with me. And you've been giving, asking for signs eternally. Now, the final thing is this. After you step out, after you step out and you say, okay, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to sign up for the worship team. I'm going to sign up for the children's church. All the men in the house, did you hear that? I'm going to sign up for the children's church. All the men in the house, did you hear that? All the men in the house, did you hear that? Sign up for the children's church. It's not women's work. That's bull. Hello? I just had to touch that one. It's one of those sacred cows. Children's church is for women to teach. No, it's not. It's for everybody, male and female. But after you've taken the step, do not be surprised if after having taken the step and you're now going, doubt resurfaces. How many times have you made a commitment to something and after you've made the commitment, you say, Ish, why did I do that? Did I, how, why? You know, you've, you went for the interview and you decided this was the job for you. And the first few days after, I say, e, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have taken that. Maybe I shouldn't have taken this job. Ah, what was I thinking? Huh? Some of you got married. And you remember that wedding day, don't you? When you stood there in the church in your lovely gown and your lovely suit. And everybody was shouting for you. And whatever, and whatever. And it was a great, wonderful day. And you looked at this person you were getting married to. And you thought, ah! Man, I've struck gold. <laughs> I found my pot of gold at the end of my rainbow. Here's my rainbow. She's my pot of gold. He's my pot of gold. And you thought, oh, ha, ha, ha. this is beautiful. Amen. Wonderful. And then three weeks later, you woke up and said, what the hell did I do? Did I make a mistake? He's not Mr. Perfect. She's not Miss Perfect. Ah. And some of you had that experience. It's not abnormal. But what you didn't do, for some of you, you didn't believe it. Because you knew it was bull. Because you had to remember, like God said to the people of Israel, remember I took you out of Egypt and I saved you and I did all of this stuff. You go back and you remember, wait a minute. This is the person that I met, the man or the lady, depending on your gender. This is the person I met and this is where, and, and no, okay, so she's not like Miss Perfect and he's not Mr. Perfect. But this is the person I love. And I'm going to stick with him. I hope the new couple at the back are listening carefully. I'm going to stick with him. Because I made the right choice. The enemy will come and try to get you to question the choice you made when you made it sanely. And with all your faculties in, per, in, in place. And with God's hand upon you. You made a choice. And then the enemy comes and says, So, did you make the right one? You chose to be part of the worship team and then you have to be at 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Or 6 o'clock, 6.30. And the enemy says, really? That Kevin now, do you know what? He's probably not coming on, at 6.30. I bet he's going to come late. And even if Kevin comes on time, he's insensitive. He really doesn't care about you. Huh? How can he expect you? I mean, doesn't he think you've got family? Just because at the moment his kids are not with him, he thinks he can, everybody's like him. They don't have children to look after. And so on and so forth. And the enemy's coming at you to resurface doubt. And what do you have to do? You've got to say, hey, Tula Wena, 
I know my God. I know God called me to be in this prayer ministry, in this outreach ministry, in this music ministry. I know God called me and said that I should marry this person. And yes, maybe things aren't going so well right now, but that's okay. Because God called me to be here. I want to just let you, as I close, give you some, some comparisons between what I call a defensive mindset and an offensive mindset. Because God is wanting us to be an offensive people, not offensive in the sense of being rude and obnoxious, but being on the attack, being on the offense. Because you know in, in, in sport, you play defensively, but then you've got to play offensively. All right. The first thing is this, a defensive mindset. Number one, he says... Block the opposition from scoring. That's a defensive mindset. Stop them from scoring. Put all the guys in the defense. Put all the guys at the back. Move everybody to the back. Don't let them score. That's a defensive mindset. An offensive mindset is score goals, man. How many of you have ever watched a soccer team, a hockey team? They're in a scoring position and then they keep passing the ball. They keep... And you think, but... Brah, the, the goal was open. What are you doing? Because he lacked confidence that he could score the goal. Because his mind is defensive. Someone's going to come and, no, kick that ball and score the goal. Hit that ball and score the goal. Take that shot and score the basket. So a defensive mindset is thinking about not letting the opposition score. The offensive mindset is, there's a goal there. I've got to put the ball through that goalpost as many times as possible. Let's go do it. That's an offensive mindset. Defensive. Everything that happens to me, defensive, he says, everything that happens to me is indicative that I am under attack. Everything that happens to me is because I'm under attack. My car's got a flat wheel. See, the enemy is attacking me. <laughs> No, fix your wheel, man. But what is an, an offensive mindset? What happens to me is the result of me going somewhere and doing something. You know why this is happening? Because I'm going there. Because I'm stepping out to do what God has called me to do. That's why this stuff is happening, because I'm going there. Not, oh, look, things are happening. Oh, I'm under attack. Poor me. No, I'm attacking. And that's why stuff is happening to me, because I'm on the attack. I played basketball with one of our senior boys this past week. He's about six foot four, I think, or something. But he's up, he's, he's up here. Young guy, athletic, fit, can jump, can almost dunk the ball, which is terrible because he should be able to. And, and I said, and I was helping him with his shooting, and then we said, okay, let's play a bit of a one-on-one -on -one game. And so I, took, I, I dribbled, and I came, and I took a shot, and he blocked it. Bloop, he blocked the ball. I got the ball back, I took, I took another shot, he, he blocked it. And I came third time and he blocked and he said to me, aren't you going to stop? I said, no, I'm going to score. And I did. Because I said, I know him. He's young. He's blocked me three times. He thinks I can't do anything. I'll show him now. I'm going to fake him into next week. And I faked him into next week and I scored the basket. And he looked at me and said, I told you, I'm on the attack, bro. I'm going to keep scoring. And I won that game. We, fight. we played four games. He won two, I won two. He should have won all four. But the key is, as an offensive player, I'm on the offense. I watched my tennis player. He was being defensive. Do you know what he did? He was retreating to the back line of the tennis court all the time. And he was trying to play from the back line. I said, no, serve and volley. Get up there, man. Go to attack the net. Let that guy see that you're coming at him. But he didn't. And that was his choice. Unfortunately, he lost the game. So that leads me to the next one. The defensive mindset is spend most of our time backpedaling. The mindset of the offensive player is what new thing can I do? Where can I take ground? Where can I get in? How can I make a plan? A defensive mindset says I'm usually reactive. Let's see what they're going to do. Let's see what they're going to do. So we go to the basketball court and we say this. Let's see what kind of defense they mount. Let's see what kind of offense they mount. And then we'll do what we're going to do. No, no, no. An offensive mindset is, guys, when we go onto the court, this is what we are playing. Yeah, but what about them? I don't care about them. This is what we're doing. We control the play. We dictate the pace of play. We do it, not them. We go on the offensive 
Because we are the ones that are in charge. But the church, and you know what COVID has done? COVID has taught us to say, let's see what is the next uh, list of protocols. And I'm not against them. I'm just saying that what we've become is we've become defensive. So we're on the defense. We need to be more on the offense. So well, what can we do? Okay, we've got to have 50 people. How do we get around that? How do we work a, a plan? How do we do this? And we go somewhere with it. Instead, many times, believers are on the defense. Let's see what's the next thing they're going to pull out of the hat. Okay, and then we'll respond to that. Do you remember the time of backward masking? Some of you will remember. Because you're old like me. When there was a time when, if you played the record backwards, it was saying, you going to hell, you going to hell, you going. And everybody was into backward masking. When the COVID va vaccine came out, everybody was into the mark of the beast. And it was only de defensive. I mean, somebody put out an article, some of you might have seen it. Some guy has said, in two years' time, all those people who had the vaccine are all going to die. Have you ever read that? And I'm saying, and then? What's your point? I want to die. Because I go to heaven. <sighs> I'm not saying I want to die now. Don't get me wrong. So don't put, put your guns away. But you see, there's all this defensive strategy. So you've got to hide away in your little corner. That's why people are hiding away in their homes. They, they don't go outside. They don't go anywhere. COVID is real. But it doesn't mean you've got to stay hidden away forever. Take your safety measures, sanitize, wear a mask, but for goodness sake, get out there and start living. Keep your social distance if you must, but get out there and start living. Go to the supermarket and say, walk over there, brother. It's nice to see you. Did you know Jesus loves you? But no, I can't leave my house. I have to stay at home. I'm not saying be foolish. I'm saying let's get on the offensive more and more. Finally, And this one is the tough one. Oh, some of you are going to not like me for this one. A defensive mindset looks to limit or eliminate personal damage, hurt, or discomfort. A defensive mind says, I've got to find ways to limit or eliminate personal damage or hurt or discomfort. So when I tell the boys we've got to do cross country, when I tell them we've got to do 50 push-ups, oh no, they struggle because they've got this idea. When God begins to speak to Gideon, I want you to go out there, he points to all of his, and he's figuring out how do I do this without getting hurt? How do I do this without getting into trouble? What, is the over, what does the offensive mindset say? The offensive mindset says, I'm looking to inflict the most damage. <laughs> I'm looking to inflict the most damage. That's why I like the guy with the vegans at his door. Come to my window. Watch me eat. Because they couldn't go onto his, into, his, into his shop front. They couldn't go inside, but they could stand out on the side. And say, carry on. Watch me, baby. I'll eat. We need more Christians who stand up and say, come at me with your cock and mammy stories and your lovely Buddha stories about transgender equality and what. And talk to me about the... It's okay. I'm going to tell you about the God who loves you beyond all of that. The God who will make a difference in your life. Yeah, but I don't believe in your God. That's okay. He made the world and he loves you. Oh, you're crazy. How can you believe God made the world? What do you believe? We came from a rock. When, who's the dumb one? You see, we're too nice. We're too polite. Because we like kids and we want to hide in the shadows. He said what we should be saying is, no, that's rubbish. And use those kinds of words. Because, listen, I don't know if you know this, but the world is not pulling any punches. They are having pastors arrested. They're closing down churches. They've got us down to 50 per meeting. Come on. And there are people that are enjoying watching Christians squirm. And you know why we don't speak up? Because our defensive mindset says, limit personal injury or discomfort. I say let's meet at 6 o'clock gents for a prayer meeting. Or 5 o'clock in the morning for a prayer meeting. Uh. In winter. Are you mad? I remember many years ago, Pastor Billy. 
Kev, Pastor Kevin's dad called us all together as men for an early morning prayer meeting here in, 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 in his office. He used to come on his motorbike. Leather jacket, scarf, helmet, big gloves and all. He used to come. We came in our cars with a cup of coffee, steaming nice. And we came and for over a year, in summer and winter, we met and we paid the price, paying, praying and praying and praying. Here's the point. A defensive person says, you want me to wake up early in the morning? Are you mad? What am I going to tell my wife? Tell her you're going to pray for her and for her safety and for her protection. Tell her you're going to do some kingdom business. Honey, I'll be there, but I'll be back at 7 o'clock to make sure you get to work on time. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the offensive mindset. The defense is, hey, bro, you don't know my wife. Eesh. If I tune her, I'm going out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning. She's going, what? Where are you going? Who are you going to see? So my question to you is this, as I close. Are you going to grovel in the dirt like an eagle, in, uh, like a chicken on a farm when you're supposed to be an eagle? Are you going to be defensive in your faith? Or are you going to take a step of faith and be offensive? Take the, take the attacking position. Putting yourself forward. Volunteering. I want to see some men who literally will take me very seriously and go and see Mickey and say, Mickey, you know what? I know that people may laugh at me, people may make fun of me, and I know it's going to look crazy, but teach me to be a children's church teacher because some men need to teach our kids. I want to hear that. I want to see some people, not everybody, but I want to see some people taking on the transgender movement because it's coming to Zimbabwe, live and kicking. I want to see some people take on that transgender movement and argue and, and, and fight and stand up for us. I want to see some of God's people taking up the issues of poverty and begin to say, no, this is what we can do. This is what God is looking for. It doesn't have to be everybody, but it has to be you. Where does God call you? Maybe there's some women who need to get up and fight for women's rights and uh, uh, anti, uh, what's it, gender-based violence against gender-based violence. Maybe we need some of our women to get fired up and go and see that. Maybe you've been an abused woman and you can counsel and you can speak to someone who's been abused. But you're hiding behind, you know, it was so painful, it was so traumatic. That's why you need to get out and help someone who's going through the same thing. Because you know how painful it is. You know how hurtful it is. You know how devastating it is. And God has brought you out of it. That's why you need to get out there. You were abandoned by your father. You were abandoned by your mother. That's why you need to go and help troubled young people who have been abandoned by their parents. Because you know it. And God has brought you through it. Instead of standing and saying, it's too traumatic for me to remember those years. Yes, it is. But for heaven's sake, think about those who are going through it currently. Who needs somebody who says, I understand what you're going through. My son, my daughter, my child, my friend. I understand what you're going through. Come here. I've got a good news for you. It's not over. And though you are feeling the pain, and though you are feeling what you're feeling, I know a God who steps into that situation and can make you whole again and can restore you. How do I know? Because he did it for me. There's the question. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and say, yes, it's me. Because some of you are scaredy cats. You're scared to sit down and say, ah, not, not today. So I'm not going to ask you to stand up for that. I'm going to ask you to stand up for the closing prayer. So let's all stand. As we close in prayer, we've got to go.